Okay, so hello everybody. Good afternoon. Today we're going to have a look at a very interesting subject, the past pawn. I think it's one of the most uh, intriguing strategy subjects, which can also become very tactical. I mean, the further the past pawn gets, the more tactics come up in the position. But we will look at the past pawn from a I would say from a mainly strategical perspective, but of course, there will also be a lot of tactical considerations in these examples. And as a warm up, I wanted to show a position that I played myself the other day uh, in a blitz game. I happened to, uh, to end up in this position with the white pieces. And uh, I will simply ask you to send me white's best move here. If you can send me white's best move, and perhaps you would like to add a little variation. So why to play? Try to find the best way to go with the white pieces. Two minutes. OK, time's up. I got a few right answers here. Uh, I think the fastest one was Tori Porat. And then we also had Evan Han, although Evan didn't give a lot of variations. And Troy gave very good variations as well. So let's uh, hear what Tori has to say. Tori, please uh, share with us how to continue with white here. Um, I played rook a4 because uh, the queen is limited because they can't move anywhere else the knight will be hanging. So sure. the only option is for the knight to take on e3. Okay. So after knight takes e3, I played rook takes b4. So uh, black is forced to take the queen or else you're just down a queen. Sure. And then I played rook b8 check. Uh -huh. so, so if the rook probably won't take, because that's just a quicker way to get a queen. But sure, sure. You're right. <laughs> After the king moves and rook takes, yeah, uh, you'll still be able to promote. Of course, we're going to promote. But I have one question for you, Tori, in this variation. I mean, you have spotted the right move. That's great. But I guess you also had a look at the move queen takes b2. I mean, black could, in fact, exploit the fact that the white queen is, is unprotected on, on c2 in order to offer the exchange of queens. And let me tell you that when I played this game, I didn't play rook a4 because I couldn't see this clear what would happen here. But maybe you have an idea about how to continue here with white? Um, I was thinking queen takes b2. Sure. And then after this... Uh-huh. Uh hmm. Yeah, some of your fellow students, they already have some, some ideas here. Some people are saying we can play perhaps rook a2 and then try to help the, the pawn. By With knight b5. b5. But maybe, I don't know, maybe black could play here knight e8. Uh, I'm not 100% sure here if we're going to win this. I think there is a better option for, for white here after knight takes b2. I think the rook could maybe uh, do a great job here. Uh, we could use the rook in a different way. So, I mean, if on a2, the rook is a bit passive, right? a6. Exactly. We could go to a6. And now it's it's clear what white is planning, right? We would like to play knight b5. And if possible, we would like to use the rook. Uh, I mean, apart from knight c7, we have another idea, which would be rook b6 and rook b8. Uh, pretty much what you were saying. Try to reach b8 with the rook. And in this way, the knight is protecting the pawn. That's important. So I guess black would have to play here knight c4. And let's see if we can finish off this variation. OK, uh, Tori just uh, left us. Well, it doesn't matter. Let's see if I can do it on my own. I think white should play now knight b5. As you can see, there is the threat of knight c7. Black is basically forced to play knight e8. Please notice that if black takes on e3, there is no reason for us to play knight c7. Then black could perhaps sacrifice, right? They could sack the exchange here. So much better for us is just to take back on e3. And whenever passed pawns are on the board, we don't care about double pawns or weaknesses and so on. Because here the key thing is simply to, to 
how do you say, to promote the pawn. That's, we want to push it forward. We don't care about weaknesses. So as you can see here, if knight d8, we're ready to go rook b6, and uh, white wins. One important factor is that this bishop is not, I mean, it's a nice uh, Benko bishop, but it's not helping in black's defense in any way. So white will just win by rook b8 next turn. So after knight b5, black would have to play knight e8. And uh, I don't know if anyone can see the right move for white here. It's not very difficult. Uh, we should just help the past pawn. Aha, Troy found it. Excellent, uh, Troy. You can share with us, Troy, the move so that everybody can can hear what you have noticed here. Well, we need to get our rook to b6, so knight d2, removing the defender of b6 with... Exactly. Yeah. We're removing the defender of the b6 square. So whatever black plays here, let's say knight takes d2, you yeah, will simply take play. It, yeah. Yeah, we just take it. We, we don't, like I was saying, we're, we're not interested in mixing things up here. Rook p6, perhaps there might be some some sacrifice. I don't know. Why why on earth should, should we bother with that? We just take back and, as uh, Troy is saying, rook p6 is coming up. Black can simply resign here. Okay. So, uh, I wanted to show you this example to so that you feel the power of the past form. In this sense, why to just try to help that past one with all, all his pieces. Try to make it advance one more step. Obviously, it's already on the uh, seventh rank. And for this reason, you should play rook a4 here. And I also picked this example because I failed myself. Okay, it was a blitz game, but still, I played in the game bishop c1, my opponent played knight b6, and uh, yeah, I had to struggle here to, to win the game. But rook a4 would have been winning on the spot. So it's very important to understand, as soon as you have a past pawn, Try to remove the defenders of the past pawn. Fight against the defenders of the past pawn. And usually, the lesser pieces on the board, the better for the side with the past pawn. So, rook a4, very nice move. White is not caring about the pawn. He's not caring about double pawns. He's just caring about helping his past pawn to advance. And that's why this is so important. Knight b5 and these ideas. Okay, let's continue. Let's see now interesting example. Our next game features Daniel Dubov. I'm sure you all know about Dubov. He's one of the brightest players, I would say, in modern chess. I really like to follow his games. He has a very active style, a very sharp player, says Austin. Yeah, you're right, uh, Austin. He's a very sharp player, and also he's very inventive in opening theory. He has a lot of interesting ideas in opening. So I would say whenever Dubov is around, you, you can be assured that that will be a very entertaining games. And here we have one example. This is from the Russian championship uh, last year. As you can see, white, yeah, it's a messy position, I know, but white has a passed pawn. That's, that's important to notice. Uh, we have this pawn on, on d5. And uh, there are other features in, in this position. Yeah, you can say that black also has a passed pawn, but it's probably not very powerful. It's easy for white to pick that pawn up. Uh, so, I will not ask you for the best move in the position because it was not played in the game, perhaps. I will simply ask you what do you think Dubov played here. So, two minutes, send me what you think is uh, White's uh, most interesting choice here. And if you like, you can just write some comment as well, some uh, explanation why you like this move. So, send me the move you like most for White. Okay, time's up. We had many different uh, ideas here. And some of you actually found the move that the engine prefers, which is not the same move that Dubo played in the game, just for the record. So, a very reasonable move for white here would be e4. That's what the engine says. And here, black would take on b5. I think that's the reason why he didn't play it in the game. He was not so convinced about this position. Now, of course, we can pick up the Pawn on f2, notice that if white plays e5, which looks nice in the first place, black is ready to go queen a6. So that's important to understand that black also has his threats here in this position. So rook takes f2, black would have to move away his queen. I guess he would go to a6 in order to win time. And after knight e3, what black could try to play here, taking into account also that the knight is hanging, is knight d7. So this is a good idea for the player who's playing against the past pawn, try to block it. So in the best of worlds, the knight could go to e5. Okay, Arnav says rook c8, but then I don't know, maybe you will have a trouble with bishop h3, or, or that doesn't matter. 
Well, maybe, yeah, you're right. Maybe you can play rook c8 as well. But anyway, as a general plan here, knight e7 would make sense. Try to bring the knight to e5. Uh, the computer likes this position very much for white, but in the game, Dubov found another idea for, for white. So let's, let's listen to Sarvagna Velidandla. Uh, please, Sarvagna, share with us which move do you like for white here? I was thinking about d6, um, knight b6. Sure, d6, uh, we're pushing the past pawn and also we're preparing to go knight b6. Then there is also a tactical detail. Maybe you saw it, so like if I take on b5, I would actually lose a piece here. Why to play and win a piece, right? We have a simple tactic here. Knight as, you can, as you can see, both these pieces are a bit loose, right? So I guess you could go knight b6, but even better would be perhaps the other way, right? If you want to attack them both at the same time. Oh, knight a3. Exactly. I think that that's uh, just winning for white. It's completely winning. It's, sometimes it's difficult for us humans to go backwards. We talked about this, that some other session. So you're right. D6 is what well, I think is the nicest move here. And that's what he played in the game. So after rook a8, he continued in the way that, that you said, knight b6. Uh, I also thought about the move rook d5. It looks nice. Uh, sometimes when you push a pawn, you can immediately uh, use the squares vacated by that pawn, like here, rook d5. But anyway, it's very clear cut what he plays in the game. Knight b6. And uh, OK, here black played rook e5. He must protect the knight somehow. And it can, of course, not move, because then he would lose the bishop. So what do you think, Sir Wagner, after rook e5? Which move do you like most for white here? Or what do you think Dubov played in this position? Which move would be the most forceful continuation, in, in your opinion? And I can tell you that many or several of your fellow students have found uh, the right move here. Uh -huh. Is it queen take c5? Exactly, bravo, that's the right move. That's how he played. It's not only a very beautiful move, it's also a very strong move. Because now Dubov is removing the defenders of the past pawn. And as we will see soon, black will end up with a queen against rook and the bishop. And the queen is not, I mean, it's a good defender, but it's only one piece, while the rook and the bishop are two pieces. Well. We will come to that. Yeah, the engine likes knight takes d7, which is also possible to take that pawn. Black could take on b5, and white uh, could not play bishop c6 here due to rook c5. So he would have to play something else. And for sure, white has an advantage here. But I like, of course, more what he played in the game. Dubov, queen takes, rook takes, knight takes d7, queen g5. So which one of the rooks would you take here, uh, Sar Wagner? The c. Or actually, no, that rook on f8, d7. Okay, can you give an argument? Why would you take the rook on f8? Um, so d7, and then the queen has to go back to d8. Exactly. So, I mean, again, if we compare these two rooks, it's rather clear that it's the rook on f8, which has the highest defensive potential, so to speak. So it makes, makes more sense to eliminate that rook. So knight takes f8, king takes f8, just like you're saying, d7. Black had to play queen d8, as we all know. The queen is not a good blocker. I mean, it's it's good at blocking, perhaps, but it's better to block the past pawns with a piece of less value, because obviously, if it's threatened, it's bad news for us. So it would have been better to have some other piece there. But anyway, black had no choice here. So your next move, uh, very simple. We we have no reason to, to mess this up. White has a huge, huge advantage. He should just uh, stabilize the position. So what would you play, Sir Wagner? Rook f2. Yeah, we should just take that pawn. The other pawn, we can wait with it. That pawn will fall, fall off later on. So just rook takes f2. And this is basically, I would say, a matter of technique. Material is more or less balanced, but this pawn, as you can see, it's no longer a normal pawn. I mean, this, this pawn is not worth one point, like we were taught when we were beginners, that each pawn is worth one point. This is worth much more. So white is basically winning here. He should just make sure that this pawn stays on the ball. He can lose any other pawn, but that pawn must stay on the ball. So after rook, rook c7, Sar Wagner, what should white play? Bishop h3. Of course, bishop h3. That's the only priority here. That's also interesting with past pawns. Once they appear on the board and they are very advanced, strategy, in a sense, becomes more simple. It's the only thing that matters is the past pawn, both for the side uh, having it and the side playing against it. So g6 was played here. 
Okay, Evan says that if a pawn advances, it's worth one point more depending on the situation. Well, that sounds almost philosophic, Evan. Uh, interesting theory. Yeah, I'm sure that the more it advances, the more important, the stronger it becomes. So let's uh, finish off this example, Sir Wagner. What to play with white here? You don't want black to play f5, do you? No. So you could play e4. That's that's a reasonable move here. Oh, yeah. E4. Yeah, you could. But actually, Dubov didn't. And I'm not completely sure what was the reason he didn't play it. Maybe he didn't like black playing king e7. In the game, he played a much nicer move. He physically prevented f5. So what did he play? Aha, Troy found it, Arnav, Zoe. Rook f6. Oh, exactly, Rook f6. That's a nice move. Again, it's a, it's a beautiful move and it's a very strong move. Black cannot take, of course, then the pawn would queen. So what happened here? Now king e7 is useless because Dubov has prepared to go rook df1. And as we can see, no matter how black takes on d7, he will end up losing a lot of material. So the king, unfortunately, had to go back to g8. And here it's easy, but still I like this final part of, of this example. First, rook fd6, securing the rook, securing the pawn. Now it doesn't matter that black plays f5 because we have two rooks protecting the pawn, right? And when black plays rook c2, which would be the most technical choice here, Salvagna, for white? The most technical choice. In order not to risk anything, what would you play? You can see that actually black has some distance, distant dreams of creating a fast pawn. So what would you play? Oh, we have a lot of uh, conversation in the chat here. The flag is stronger than the fall. Well, unless checkmate. I think we're going, getting uh, further and further away from the subject. Uh, anyway, yeah, Austin found this move as well. So what do you think, Sir Wagner? Should we protect that pawn? Um, or, yeah. Uh, or should we use Yeah, I'm that's... Bishop e6. That's a nice move. I didn't even think about it. Bishop e6. But it's it's very, very, very flashy move, right? Yeah. Let's see if it works. So if I take, you will take. You're now threatening to go rook e8. I cannot see how to defend with, with black here. Somebody with a very good tactical vision. Rook c1, is that possible? Well, we're now in some deep tactical variation here. I would say this is not necessary. It's not completely necessary, is it? Uh, rook endgame. There might be some, okay, Cooper says just play king f7 immediately. When is that? Oh, here. Okay, okay. I understand. Yeah, of course, you're right. Uh, you can see that I'm not using an engine here. <laughs> That's a much better move, of course. I understand your point, Cooper. Yeah, take with the queen. So, too, too flashy, uh, bishop e6, uh, Sir Wagner. Let's play something more, more simple. No Cooper, rook king f7, rook f1. Let's see if I follow you here. What What is that? I don't follow, I don't follow. No, this is okay for black. What rook f1? There is no rook f1 here, no. So, uh, yeah, let's get back to this position. Let's not complicate things when we are already winning, right? So, Sir Wagner, sorry, please continue. On the a3. Okay, that's a very reasonable move, a3. I cannot see any big uh, flow with that move. Maybe you don't want him to take that pawn. But okay, then you, you would say that you play rook c1, right? This is a is typical it, method when... Is it like rook 6, d2? Before? Yeah, that's what that's what he played. But I was just curious about your variation. Please notice, whenever somebody plays uh, this against you, consider a king move. King g7 should be reasonable here. And if white plays rook c8, I'm sure you can all see what might happen here. Black might have some counterplay. Is that so? Queen e7, perhaps? Queen a5 says, oh, yeah, that's a nicer move. Yes, for sure. Now we have a counterattack. So no matter what happens here, no matter what happens, I think we should avoid this. Maybe rook d1, I don't know. But why on earth should we make things so complex? And Dubov, no matter, he's a very entertaining player, but when he's winning, I think he doesn't want to risk anything. So yeah, just like you say, Sir Wagner, rook 62, that should be the right move. And if now rook takes, rook takes, White will have a very simple plan here. Uh, which would be this winning plan here, Savagna, for White? Um, rook c2 to c8. Mm -hmm. Exactly, rook c2 to, to c8. This is, of course, very basic, but I think still it's very important. Once you have a pawn on the seventh rank, you should try to use these squares. And if I play f5, how can you renew this idea, so to speak? 
E4. Yeah, E4, nice. But also, I think perhaps even simpler, just bishop G2. And if B6, you can put the bishop on C6 and you bring the rook to. Yeah, in some way, you will bring the rook to, to E8. So this is just game over. In the game, they played rook C7. And uh, yeah, I guess you, you can see what white played here. Just the same idea that we looked at. D6. Uh, yeah, rook D3, preparing to go rook E3. Black tried F5. And here, in order to deflect the black rook from the pawn. B6. B6. Okay, that's it. Black played rook C2. And the last move of the game, mm. to finish off this very nice example. Bishop G2. Okay, to make him suffer. Yeah, I mean, from a psychological point of view, you can play that. But if you want to finish the game a bit earlier, what would you play? Rook E3. Rook E3. So it's game over. Rook E8 is coming next move. Black resigned. Okay, thanks, uh, Sarvagna. Excellent work. What we have seen here is that Dubov, from the very beginning, is betting on the passed pawn. If it can advance, it should advance. There is a saying in the endgame, right? Passed pawn should advance. Of course, there are exceptions to, it, to this principle, but it works surprisingly well in practice. So d6 was a very nice move by white. Uh, we have this little tactical trick that bishop takes b5, fails to knight a3. And apart from that, we're trying to prepare here knight b6. Now the queen cannot take on b6 anymore, so it's a good moment for knight b6. And I'm pretty sure that when playing d6, Dubov had already visualized this sacrifice. Well, I don't know if it's a sacrifice in the true meaning of the word, uh, because you eliminate the two of the main, or three of the main defenders of the past pawn, which should be very good news for white. And the rest was rather simple, right? Black can temporarily prevent the advance of the past pawn, but sooner or later he's doomed in, the, in this position. Uh, the queen is, is very sad to take up this task of defending against the past pawn. So black would very much have preferred to have the rook on d8 and the queen on c5. But I guess even then, he would be in trouble here. So Nice example, I think. Rook f6, very nice movement. You should just stabilize the position, and sooner or later, white will try to find a way to bring a piece to e8 or c8, and that's what happened in the game. Ah, king d8, says Arnov. Yeah, it, it would maybe be better to have the king on d8, but that was never really possible. Okay, another issue is how do we then obtain a passed pawn? Which are the possible ways in which a passed pawn can appear on the board? Let's have a look at this subject. Here we have, with the black pieces, a very strong player from India, Gukesh. A very impressive young player. I think he's already uh, going for 2600 ELO. Uh, he has a very bright future. So, two minutes. What do you think Duke, uh, Gukesh played here? Sorry, what do you think Gukesh played? Please send me Black's best move and a general idea for Black. Okay, time's up. We had a lot of people who found the right way to go here. Uh, I think it's not that difficult, but uh, great. Great if you found it. Um, so I don't, I don't think I'm able to name all of you, but uh, the fastest one on this one was Arnav Gupta. So Arnav, please uh, share with us how to play with Black here. Yeah, so I would play c4. Uh-huh. What's the idea? And the idea is knight b6. Okay. And um, maybe a5, b4 in the future. Sure. And the black rook also gets activity. So maybe a rook lift to d5 or g5. Okay, that's that's another interesting idea. Aha, uh -huh. to use the rook on the... King side, but also you could perhaps use it on the queen side, right? You could put it on c8, and if we're lucky, we might later on be able to play even c3, right? Creating a pass yeah. Aha. And let me tell you, Arnav, that also in the game, well, white played here b3. This was not a good choice, but uh, it's natural. Somehow white tried to attack the pawn on c4. And here, Gukesh didn't play knight b6. He could have played it. I thought about this move. But I thought that perhaps white could take and put uh, a queen on c3. As some of you might have noticed, uh, we cannot take here on c4 due to this standard tactical trick. But uh, white could perhaps play queen c3. Uh, yeah, we said that the queen is not a good blocker, but uh, there's no other piece available. So maybe uh, white could hang on here. Knight e4, definitely black should be careful allowing knight e4. So in the game, Arnav after b3, 
actually fi- Black found a much nicer move. And uh, it's a tactical move, which Gook has found at this point. Let's see if you can find it. Rook Based on a uh, fork, perhaps? Um... Like these pieces around here, they might be exposed to a fork from the Black Knight. Bishop F, knight, knight e5? Yeah, almost. I mean, knight e5 again, I think if you play that, it's it's perfectly perfectly possible. But somehow white would try to play queen c3 here and block the pawn on c4. Uh, it's not the best blocker, but it's all we, we got. But there is a stronger move here. Aha, Aradia, Austin have found it. Asish found it as well. Kevin found it. Five. Yeah, knight c5, exactly. That's how the game went. And here, already, White is in deep trouble. He took on c4. Uh, there's not much more to do. Among other things, this pawn is, is very weak. And what follows now, Arnav? Rook takes d2. Of course. Please notice, everyone, that uh, Black does not win material by doing this. It's not a combination to win material. It's simply a combination to reach a better endgame. So, please continue, Arnav. Knight b3. Sure, sure, sure. Sorry if I'm not able to answer everybody in the chat. Uh, congratulations to Radia and uh, Nathaniel who found this uh, nice little combination as well. Okay, so how would you take on C4 now, Arnold? With the pawn. With the pawn, of course. Because the further this past pawn gets, the better. So it's, uh, it's of course, a good opportunity to create an advanced past pawn. Yeah, White's next move is not difficult to understand. Queen C3. And here we have an interesting situation because if you compare the different pieces, uh, the piece which is most useful, I would say, when we have a passed pawn is the queen because the queen is very good at unblocking the opponent's queen. So I'm sure you can see the next move here, right, uh, Arnold? Queen B8? Yeah, queen B8. In the game, uh, Gook has played queen B6, but I think it's roughly the same thing. Aha, uh-huh. very nice little tactical move. Uh, as you can see here, bishop takes is impossible. Then there will be a pin somehow on the C file. And now queen B3 is threatened. Also, black can play for queen B1, but basically I would say queen B3 is what, what he's trying to play here. There was a famous endgame, by the way, uh, Marshall Capablanca in the year... Uh, 1909, those of you who are very intrigued by chess history can look up that game. Uh, Capablanca won in very similar style to, to Gukas here. Okay, let's continue. Bishop d1, there was queen b1, like we were saying, black can also bother white on the first rank. And after queen c2, Arnav, what do you think uh, Gukas played? Takes. No, he didn't take, because if you take, I still have a slight chance of, if I'm able to bring my king to c3, let's say, I would have chances for a draw, right? And also notice that bishop f5, the idea is excellent, but I think, yeah, no, it's not so excellent. No, no, it's, it's a bad idea, I think, because I can get there with the king. But even so, even if this wouldn't work, I would also be able to play e4. So definitely bishop f5 does not make sense. However, we can use this idea in a better queen portion, a1. right? Sorry? Queen a1. Yeah, you're right. Queen a1 is interesting as well. Why didn't he play queen a1? Good question. Uh, because now he's attacking the pawn and at the same time he's preparing c3. Was he bothered by some perpetual perhaps? Is that possible? What do you think, guys? Is this reasonable or no? No perpetual, right? I can always take and, and go back with my queen. Yeah, you're right. Queen a1 is very reasonable. But okay. Uh, Austin says, and Zoe, they say that there is another easier choice for black here. And I think so, yeah. After all, we try to find the simplest path, right? So which would be the simplest path, or not? Apart from Queen A1, very good move. Uh, there is another move which is perhaps even better. Bishop F5. Sure, Bishop F5. I just continue thinking about your move, Queen A1. Maybe he would play here Queen A4. Is that possible? That might be the idea, right? White's That's idea. Or, or then you just push the pawn anyway. King h2, maybe. I suspect that he didn't want to even calculate some kind of, you know, checks or perpetual. I don't think there is a perpetual. But I, I think he, he wanted to play the simplest way as possible. So he played here the very nice move, bishop f5. In this way, 
he's getting ready to take on B1. And as you know, when you have a bishop, uh, it's important to try to cover the square uh, on which the pawn will advance. So here, black is tactically winning, right? Yeah, no way black can, white can prevent the march of the C pawn. So in the game, white played queen D2. I'm sure you can find black's uh, next move here. Uh, Arnav, you don't want to create a counterplay. Bishop so you D3. don't play C3. Sorry? Bishop D3. Yeah, you could also play Bishop D3. Yeah, you're completely right. Why didn't Kukas play that? Good question. Maybe King H2. And if you play C3, I mean, this is not something that I checked. I'm just thinking that perhaps would White have some chances for a draw here? No, I don't think so. No. But again, again, everything is relative, right? Perhaps uh, Black could win here, but why Why bother? Why bother? Uh, when we can play in a more practical way. Queen so, d3. Queen d3 is what he played in the game. Exactly. And this, again, if we take, bishop takes, again, there is no way white can prevent the march of the c pawn. So in the game, white played queen c1. And please continue, Arnav. Um, c3. Sure. c3, of course. Now we're happy to advance that pawn. It's very close to queening. Bishop f3. There are many ways to win here, but the simplest one... Queen b1. Queen b1, exactly. Queen takes, bishop takes, and white resigned. So, very nice example. I think, yeah, thanks, Arnav, great work. I think that uh, white cooperated here. He shouldn't have played b3. It was better to play something like knight f3, trying to bring the knight to d4, perhaps. Uh, he cooperated here by b3. But still, what I wanted to show you with this example was that when we have a pawn majority, uh, the, the logical outcome or the logical plan whenever you have a pawn majority is to try to convert that pawn into a passed pawn, that majority into a passed pawn, sorry. So that's why we play here knight c5. Thanks to this little tactical trick, we are able to create a passed pawn. And unfortunately, white is not able to defend himself here. Please notice the importance of the queens. If the queens were not on the board, I would dare to say that with king f1 followed by king e1, white would be very close to, to a draw in this endgame. But the presence of queens favors very much the side who has a passed pawn, because the queen is very good at unblocking the fellow queen, I mean the opponent's queen. Uh, if these were rooks, just imagine that this is a rook and that is a rook, it's not exactly the same thing. The rooks are somehow not as powerful. Well, in, perhaps in this case, still, white would be, black would be winning, but. Well, I'm sure you get my point. The queen is a very powerful, how can you say, uh, helper of the past pawn. Okay, let's continue. And the next example, it's uh, featuring uh, another coach here at uh, USCS. We have with the uh, white with the white pieces. No, this is another example. Oh, I, I think I have it. Where is my example? I cannot find example anymore. Oh, I must have lost it. Never mind, never mind. Yeah, here it is. Well, why did it disappear? That's funny. I will blame chess players for that. No, joking apart, here we have with the white pieces, uh, Roman Edouard, very strong French uh, grandmaster, playing with the white pieces. As you can see, again, we have the pawn majority, right? White has a pawn majority. So. What do you think White played here? I cannot even ask this, you know, with giving you time because everybody knows the, the, the answer. So, uh, Austin, you, you already replied. Austin, please share with us. What should uh, White play here? Well, it's kind of simple because he already spoiled it, but I, was... <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, it doesn't matter. So please go ahead, uh, Austin. Yeah, I play C5. Of course, we play C5. And the Grandmaster also played C5. What I wanted also you to notice here is that actually, yeah, White is kind of winning on this side, right? He has a big advantage on the Queen side. But on the King side, we can see that the White King is slightly exposed. So Black already notices here that he's in big trouble. And what do you think, Austin? Okay, I will unmute you again. What do you think, Austin, uh, should we play with the black pieces here? So let's speak a little about how to defend against the passed pawn. Black's position is very difficult, but I mean, if you have this position on the board, if you're so unlucky to have this position on the board with the black pieces, uh, 
what plan would you look for with the black pieces? Um, what comes to your mind here? I would play bishop f5. Bishop, b5. bishop, bishop b5. Yeah, that's that's an interesting move. You're right. No. I guess white would play rook e1, and perhaps I can harass uh, you later on. Let's say it's something like c6 and play a4, maybe. Um, but I, I understand you. Bishop e5 is a possible move. But you could also consider the fact that the white king is slightly exposed, couldn't you? So what what else comes to your mind here? Yeah, Arnav says this is kind of like King's Indian. I think it's a King's Indian, or no? Yeah. So, please, oh, Austin is uh, he unmuted. Uh, okay, so Arnav says rook h5. Kelsey also says rook h5. Exactly, that's what Black played in the game. Interestingly, the engine prefers here to move rook f7, but that would be depressive for any human being to play like that. But what the engine has seen is that now, if white plays c6, then black can just take on c6. While in the game, after c5, rook h5, Edward quickly played c6, which is the right move here. As you can see, he has a tactical point. Now, with the rook on h5, black cannot take on c6 because, yeah, the simple tactics, right? Queen d5 and, and white wins. So after c6, things are getting really difficult for black. But in practical play, he's doing exactly the right thing here. Takes and bishop takes h3. So now the strategy of this game is very simple. Yeah, white takes on, on h3. This is helpful in order to gain control of the light squares. And here, queen d5. Why do I say that strategy is simple here? Because white's only real plan is to advance this pawn. It can also be helped by the other pawn. At the same time, black's only plan is to attack the white king. There is no other reasonable plan for, for black. And if you check the result, this game actually ended actually with the least probable result. It ended in a draw. And uh, we will see what, what happens in this game. So, uh, what do you think black should play here, anyone? What is logical for, for black here? Well, we're in check, uh, Arnold. We have to take care of the check. So, anyone, what should black play here? You can just write in the chat. Okay, Aradia says king h8. Exactly. Please don't play queen f7 here. That's a complete misunderstanding of the position. In that case, of course, white won't rush with a c-pawn. He will rather play a4, making sure that these two pawns can advance together. And maybe at some other occasion, we can talk about connected past pawns. That's another fascinating story, connected past pawns. You can sacrifice pieces and even rooks in order to get connected past pawns. And here, right, white didn't sacrifice, well, a pawn he sacrificed, but it doesn't matter. Let's say rook h4 and b5, those pawns will just kill black in, in this uh, endgame. So, of course, we have to play king h8. Zoe is saying, so why didn't white take on d6? Yeah, that's a good question. You have to ask Grandmaster Edward next time uh, you have a lesson with him. Why didn't I take that pawn? Or anybody has the theory, what would black play here? Yeah, that, that's a very reasonable move. Why didn't he play queen takes d6? Rook d8, perhaps? Is that so? Maybe rook d8? What do you think? So that if the queen moves away, I could go queen e6, perhaps? Try to give mate? Maybe. Maybe, I'm just saying maybe. I, I'm not checking this with, a, with an engine. But for the human eye, it seems like rook d8 might be the reason why uh, white didn't want to take that pawn. So in the game, he played queen d5. Also, uh, like uh, Arnav is saying, material is not really important here. Material, pawns, and so on is not important. Both players pursue their plan. White wants to push his pawns, so he's now protecting the pawn with tempo. And black wants to attack. So strategy is very simple here. Actually, now I'm um, contradicting myself because actually now he took the pawn. <laughs> so, honestly, this is a bit difficult to, to understand. But I have I have one theory. Perhaps if rook d8 now, white could play c7. Is that so? And I can... Or is this madness? My point is that this rook might be hanging. Because if the king was on g8, black couldn't take and uh, play king f7, right? But here, there is no such thing. Or, well, 
Maybe somebody will correct me here. Rookie six. Yeah, maybe. So um, maybe it doesn't make sense what I'm saying. Well, I don't know. It still looks interesting for white, doesn't it? I can play rook d8. Yeah, very complex stuff. Very complex. Rook c6 says, says Austin. Is that possible? Yeah, I think so. Wow, like nice geometry, right? This this nice picture doesn't come across very often. Seems to me that white is winning. Uh huh. Nice, nice uh, piece of tactics. So very complex game, but still we have to look at the most important part of this game. We still have to see. So here white uh, took on d6, and black didn't play rook d8. He played here rook h4, like I think some of you were saying in the chat. Yeah, that's that's a clever move because now what black is trying to do is to play rook d4 and perhaps try to give mate on h5. Very complex, very complex. Maybe this explains why white didn't want to play c7 here. He played in the game rook fd1. Okay, this is a good move because white is bringing the last piece to the action and also in Petrosian style, he's preferring to go preferring to go rook king f1, king e2 at some moment. So. To be honest with you, White is completely winning here. And still, he didn't win the game and he almost lost it. Why did that happen? Because Black came up with a very good move here. So at this point, two minutes, try to find Black's best move, okay? Try to find, Black is, lo Black is lost, but this happens to all of us, sometimes we're lost and we still have to put up a fight, right? So please send me Black's best chance in practice. Oh, bad news. Time's up and I didn't uh, receive the right move here. Nobody sent me Black's move in the game. Let me tell you that there is a very famous game by Petrosian. I, I didn't have the time to show you last time we had a Petrosian lecture. But there is a very famous game where Petrosian was faced by, he was playing a game against Hübner. Or maybe we looked at this game at some moment. Uh, well, just to, to tell you very quickly. Petrosian had a pawn on a7, and white had a pawn on a6. White was preparing to invade along the b-file. He was going to play something like rook b7 or rook b8, something like that. Petrosian noticed, okay, so Aradia found it. Only one to find this one is Aradia. And in that game, that which I'm telling you about, Petros Hibner Petrosian, Petrosian did exactly the same thing that uh, Aradia is uh, now uh, writing in the chat. So, uh, your turn. Aradia, please share with everybody what you have uh, noticed here. Okay. Yeah, like when you started like talking about that, I immediately <laughs> knew that it's like eight six king eight seven because I think it was the same thing. Like we looked at um sure looked at it in that lecture. So, would you play h six or h five? Yeah, I guess both of them are good. Yeah, probably h five actually. Sure, because in this way, it might be helpful to have your rook protected, right, on g4. So yeah, but I don't think it's harm. that much of a difference, but yeah. Well, it's much well, you, if you say so, but I think it might be very very important. Anyway, it doesn't, doesn't matter. So I play c7. What would, would you play now, Aradia? Please continue. Oh, uh, yeah. So like now, just king h7, and it's really hard to like do anything to like the defense on... Though with the queen on e and rook on c8. I mean, what happens now if I play queen d8? Yeah, I was looking. I'm pretty sure queen e8. Wait, that plunders a rook. Uh... Just that, so that everybody understands this. I mean, this plan. Any other option? Any other? Any other idea for for black here? Some people were saying e4, and I said, what if c7 and queen d8? Some people were saying g5, and I was saying, what happens if c7 and queen d8? So this, plans, uh, this plan wins uh, every time almost for white. Only if we evacuate the eighth rank with our king, we're able to counter this plan. So that's why it's so important to play h5. And that's what Petrosian played against Hübner, and he won that. It's a very nice game that he won. If you're interested in chess history, please look up that game, Hübner Petrosian. If I'm not mistaken, after Petrosian won that game, Hübner just retired from the match. It was a candidate match and he just got, you know, demoralized by losing that game because he was probably winning. Anyway, so Aradia said here, uh, after c7, king h7, and if queen d8. So did you make up your mind, Aradia? What would you play? 
you won't lose yeah. the rook on, on h4, right? We have to save that rook first. Yeah, so rook. I had rook g4. Exactly. Rook and G4. then queen e6 seems much better. Exactly. And no matter what happens, you can be sure that in this way, you will complicate life for white. White is probably winning here. But still, uh, we have some practical chances here. Uh, and let's see what happened in the game. He didn't play queen d8 here. In the game, he played... Uh, okay, Arnav says it's too. it was too slow. Okay, maybe it's too slow. Uh, like I'm saying, white is probably winning, but it's our best chance. We have to look for our best chance. In the game, white played queen c6. It's not a bad move. This way, also, the queen takes control of the important long diagonal, ruling out the check on h1 in some variations and so on. This game is very entertaining. Black played queen f8, of course, no queen exchanges. White played rook d7. Maybe now even white might create some counter play at some moment if necessary. And black played here, queen f5. Here we have key moment of this game. Here is the key moment of the game. Here is one move which wins the game, and there is another move which loses the game. So I will just give you one minute, and you will just try to find out which would be white's best move here. I don't think it's very difficult. So one minute, try to find white's best choice at this point. OK, time's up. We had a few correct answers. Asish found the right move, and so did uh, Aralia. So Asish, please uh, share with us. What should white play here? Um, I said king f1 to e2 to like Sure, get... king f1 to play king e2, exactly. Uh, and did you check any other move, or maybe in one minute uh, you, you had no time to check alternatives? You just felt that this was the right way yeah. to go. Uh -huh. Aha. Yeah. So um... nice. Nice. That's good uh, intuition. Still, black has some checks here. I could give check on h1, but then right. obviously you're going to take the rook, right? You can just take the rook. Here. Yeah. Yeah. And when black, yeah. when black takes, we are helped by swapping pieces, of course. I think what we will do here is just to go back Please, to yeah. se secure the pawn, right? And uh, now that there is one pair of rooks less on the board and this rook is passive, I think white should be winning. If nothing else happens, maybe we can consider this plan a4 and b5. And the other option for black here would be after king f1 to play e4. In this way, he's obstructing the white queen and he's threatening to play queen f3. But what would you play here, Asish? Yeah, not, not too difficult. Uh, Just stick to your plan. Uh, king e2? Sure. This is the what I say, the escaping king idea. This was not a safe place for white's king, the king side. He's very happy to move over to the queen side. It's a much safer place. So I think black's uh, lost here. The attack is over. Queen f3, you can just play king d2. And uh, also, it's, it's good to notice that there is uh, a plan for white at some moment to play, perhaps, attack this bishop on, on g7. He might consider at some moment bishop d4. Well, if everything is protected, of course. But uh, I think black is completely lost here. So let's see what happened in the game. Some people were saying, yeah, thanks, uh, Aziz, uh, great work. Some people were saying rook d8, but this is not a good idea, because here black can play rook takes e7. As you can see, queen takes is actually made in, in two moves. And this, in this sense, you can see how black's strategy prevails in, in this variation. Yeah, white didn't play like this in the game. I think white was very low on time. He played here rook cd1. And this is a losing mistake. Incredibly enough, this is a losing mistake. I think perhaps what, I'm not sure, but maybe what White was planning was also to, at some moment, sacrifice and, and try to, you know, play rook d7 check. The king cannot go to h6. He must go down, and then we play rook d8. I think that was <clears throat> White's uh, plan here. But, okay, Nathaniel, you found it. Please share with everybody the move that you have found, the move which changes the result of this game 100%. Please, uh, Nathaniel. Well, so black can go rook takes c7 because white can't take with the rook because then queen g4 and the rook's hanging and white can't take with the queen because then queen g4 can have one rook h1 and it's checkmate. Exactly. Now the queen has been deflected again from the long diagonal. And like you're saying, white is mated. Incredible, incredible move. Rook takes c7. But let me tell you that in the game, he didn't play like this. In the game, black gave the check first. 
So what is the difference now, Nathaniel? Uh, how does he save himself here? Now, after Queen, after Queen G2, Rook takes C7. Aha, it's different, right? Then after Queen takes G4, Rook takes exactly. in F1, then four is Exactly. Eight. That's how the game went. And here the players agreed to a draw. Uh, at first sight, Black seems to be much better. No, he's a pawn up and he has a, talking about past pawns. He has a strong past pawn. However, uh, and he can even pick up this pawn on B4. However, White can... White has a funny mechanism to make a draw here. Can you see, Nathan, what uh, White should play here? You're two pawns down, but you can still make a draw here. Any idea how that could be arranged? Mm. Okay, Ar Aradia found this one. Nice. Please. Uh, okay, Nathaniel muted. Yeah, it looks like it's uh, Black is just winning here. But, you know, chess tactics is a fascinating story. We have this nice move, Bishop G5. Funny, right? We're now threatening to go bishop f6, but not only that. We're also ready to create some kind of fortress here, rook a7. And as you can see, it's not easy for black to untangle here. Uh, rook king g8 would just run into checks, right? I can give checks here. You have to look after your bishop. So black would have to play something like rook e6 and then, yeah, something like, you know, put his rook on e8, but then white will win this pawn. Probably white can make a draw here, so. Yeah, the game ended in a draw. A very complex example, what we saw here in the final part of the game was that white would probably win if you play here king f1. The black attack would come to an end and uh, the c pawn should uh, decide the game for white. But uh, white made a big mistake here, rook cd1. And just like Nathaniel was explaining, rook takes c7 would have won the game. Fantastic move. Uh, with the idea that either we deflect the rook from the defense of that rook, or we deflect the queen from the defense of the h1 square. In the game, Black noticed this idea, but he played it in a different way. He gave, he gave check first, and this gave White a chance to <laughs> to play queen g2, and he was a bit ha a bit lucky to escape with the draw here, I would say. But anyway, he was winning uh, before that, so perhaps the draw was the most fair result. But the point of this example is mainly to see how you can play against a passed pawn. So if we go back to the very beginning, white plays c5, correct plan, creating a passed pawn thanks to his pawn majority. And black noticed that passive defense would probably be hopeless in the long run. So he bravely went for a kingside attack. And the most important move, I would say, in whole, the whole black strategy here, even if he's lost, it's good to know about this stuff. The most important move here was the move in Petrosian style, h5. This is definitely only, the only way in which black can hope for salvation here. h5 in order to at least uh, step away from the uh, pin along the eighth rank and make white's, uh, how do you say, white's uh, conversion a bit more complex. And yeah, black was rewarded for that in the end. Is this position of rook text one winning, says Brian Tay? Uh, like I was saying, this position, this position is not winning. This is probably a draw. Like I'm saying, bishop d5 is a very nice uh, drawing idea, fortress idea. Maybe at some later occasion we can look into fortresses. Very uh, fascinating endgame topic. Uh, you can hold an endgame with two minus pawns, like in this case, if you know about fortress techniques. I think we will do more, two more examples, and then we will call it a day. Oh, okay. Nathaniel has a theory here. If we played h6 instead of h5, then bishop g5 wouldn't be possible and black might win. Okay, but that's... Yeah, I get your point. If we play h6 here, there would be no fortress in the end. Okay, good point, but a million other things could happen on the way. So maybe next time we can, we can have a look at that variation. Still, I think it was very useful for black too cover the, yeah, now queen, D, queen D7, Arnav says queen d7 now prevents rook g4. Yeah, I'm definite that h5 must have been more useful. And by the way, don't forget to check out that game, Hibner Petrosian. Uh, that's a really nice game about this prophylactic uh, technique, h5 and king h7. So, uh, two more examples and then we will call it a day. Uh, I wanted to show you that another way in which past pawns can appear on the board is by, mean of, by means of pawn trades. Uh, we can trade one pawn for another. 
And that's what this little example is about. So two minutes, try to find the best idea for white. Okay, time's up. We had a few different uh, suggestions here. Okay, thanks Arnav, see you. Some people were saying here, rook takes d4. I think that's possible as well. Although speaking about pass pawns, it also gives black a pass pawn. Maybe this pawn might become an asset later on. Um, yeah, we had some other uh, suggestions. Rookie one is also interesting. Maybe I can play e4 here. Is that possible? I'm not losing anything, am I? I think there is a better way to go. Let's listen to Kelsey Liu. Uh, please, Kelsey, share with us. What would you play here with white? Um, so d6 doesn't have much hope. And then black's king has a diagonal open. So you can play um, knight e3. And then after queen takes d6, queen b3, and queen takes b7 to create the pass pawn for the a pawn. Exactly. Now it's the a pawn. We had a pass pawn, right? Like, like you were saying, we had a pass pawn, the d pawn. But it was not that... Powerful, despite the fact that it's not blocked, uh, it was difficult to advance it forward. However, just like you say, we can trade this pawn for the pawn on b7. And that makes it possible to create a very strong passed pawn on the a file. And I would also say that, generally speaking, the pawns on the, let's say, the further away from the center, the passed pawns, the stronger they are, more difficult for the opponent to organize the defense when the pawns are, are on the flanks, so to speak. So you're completely right, Kelsey. That's what happened in the game. Knight e3, and I think black made this mistake here. Uh, black should have played here queen e6. Like Kelsey was saying, this diagonal is weak, so the queen should bet better stay there. Perhaps uh, he didn't like the looks of taking on d4, but then black would take on d6, and I think still black would save this. Uh, black would hold here by looking after this pawn on b7. But in the game, Black took on d6, and that let white swap that uh, pawn, I mean, regain the pawn here by queen takes b7. And this position is already very difficult for black. Please notice that this knight on e3 is a great defensive knight, no mate on g2 ever, and also it keeps track of the important square on d1. So uh, I think the computer gives a big advantage for white here, and in practice, it's even more difficult for black. Let's, let's see very quickly what happened. White now tries to remove the defenders of the past pawn, so it's a good moment for rook c8. No problems with mate here. We can always play knight f1. Black played in the game bishop d6, and the rest is very simple. We should just push the pawn, just like Dubov did, right? Should just push that pawn. And no way black can save himself here. Also notice that apart from the fact that he has a problem with the pawn, also black's king is a bit weak here. So bishop c5, for example, would simply lose to queen c8. So yeah, black is lost here. e3, last trick, white simply took with the queen and no reason to take that pawn, right? So what white will play here is queen b7. You all know about this technique. Whenever you, you have a passed a pawn, try to put your queen on b7 and then run with the pawn. I think that's what happened in the game. Yeah. So very simple example, what we have seen here, white is happy to trade the pawn on d6 for the pawn on b7 in order to enhance their passed pawn on the a file. And here is a last example on the same topic, I think. I have one last example. Yeah, this is now from the good old days. I, I thought I should put at least one classic here. So very quickly, let's see here, Smyslov against Botvinnik in the good old times. Nowadays, most people I think would just take here and play knight c6. I'm sure some of you play the Maroxi, the accelerated dragon. But in those days, yeah, Botvinnik had very specific ideas about openings. Uh, he played d6 here. No idea, really. Perhaps nowadays white would take on c5. However, in this game, they play like this. Now bishop g4. I suspect that perhaps black is doing fine here. But let's see what happened in the game. Okay. Black lost the pawn on c5, but he gets back the pawn on e4 very soon, I think. Now he played here knight f6. So it's already a very complex position. As you can see, black is about to get back the pawn on e4. At this point, I would like you to think for two minutes, try to find a great idea for white here. Try to find Vasily Smyslov's next move. Very nice 
strategical idea for white. So why to play? Try to find brilliant idea for white connected with a passport. Okay, this was a difficult one, but uh, finally I think Zoe and also Sarvagna, they found the right idea here. So uh, Zoe, please share with us how to play with white here. Uh, my idea was knight d4, so then if knight takes e4, then knight takes c6, b takes c6, bishop d4, and then pawn f3 is a fork. Oh, that's a nice idea. I didn't even think about this. Wow, bishop d4, you have found... I would like to ask Smyslov about this, but that's impossible. He's not around anymore. Maybe, just maybe, black could play e5, right? This would be the way to save myself here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I understand you, your idea. Now you can go back, but maybe I can play... C5, can I? Yeah. And then, I, then I'm not on time to play the fork. I mean, you're still threatening to play the fork, but I guess I have some counterplay here. Now I'm able I'm able to move away the bishop and still this looks nice for for white, doesn't it? Now you can play a three and you can then take on on C5. Yeah, good idea. Interesting. I, I, I didn't see this move, honestly. Uh, bishop d4. Let me say that uh, Smyslov played something much simpler here, Zoe. So, if he didn't play bishop d4, what did he play? No answer. Okay, never mind. Uh, Sarvagna found this plan and some other people as well, Asish as well. Of course, he just took the pawn on a7. So, let's see again what happened here. White noticed that he could not really save the pawn on e4 in any Good way. Of course, 92 would be a blunder here due to rook takes 62. This was one of Botvinnik's ideas. Knight takes and he picks up the bishop on c5. And other moves here. What else could white play here? e5, perhaps? But then I guess black would play knight e4 and he would have some, some counterplay. Uh, some people were saying rook b1. That's another reasonable move, but I think black could then play b6. In the game, Smyslov simply gives away the e pawn. Doesn't matter. What he's looking for here is to create a passed pawn on the A file. And for that reason, he played knight e4. If knight takes d4, we have bishop takes d4. Important uh, ta tactical detail. We're now pinning the knight so it cannot move. And if black plays, yeah, whatever here, we will just play f3, as always, idea. And this way, we we'll just remain with the extra pawn. I think even two extra pawns, right? We will pick up this pawn and we have the bishop. So huge advantage. In the game, what winning played knight takes e4. Now he got back the pawn. Unfortunately, here he's not able to take on c5 because the rook is in the air, so he must take on c6. And Smyslov takes on a7. Well, he's not winning because of this. It's just very nice for white to have a passed pawn on the a file. Let's see very quickly what happened in the remainder of this game because there is a very nice variation in the end. Uh, black played here, bishop f5. We have the situation with f3. So black must do something about that. Bishop f5. Here, Smyslov no longer thinks about material. He's only interested in advancing his passed pawn. First, he plays f3 because he has noticed that if knight takes e3, uh, white would have bishop b6. This is a good move because after rook d7, the rook must keep track of the d4 square, right? We cannot play rook b8 due to bishop d4. So the rook must go to d7. And I'm sure that all of you can see what white would play here, right? Anyone, what would you play with white here? Okay, Sarvagna says c5. Yeah, that's possible as well. You're right. Austin says a4. Yeah, Smyslov also said a4. Exactly. So he says push, push, push the pawn. <laughs> that's what Smyslov claims in his book. By the way, that's one of my favorite endgame books. The book, uh, what's the name? Uh, Smyslov's book about endgames. Well, it's about uh, written by himself, and it only features his, his endgames. Fantastic endgame book. So just run with the pawn. White should be winning here. Black species are not well placed in order to block that pawn, right? Looks very difficult for black. Let's see what happened in the game. After f3, black played knight e6. This makes sense, bringing the knight closer to the a pawn. This is a good moment to run. a4, rook a8, bishop b6. Once we play a5 or c5, uh, there will be some nice uh, teamwork, the pawn and the bishop. After castles, there was c5. Knight c8, sad place for the knight. And here, Smyslov played g4. I was trying to understand this move. Why didn't he play a5 right away? What might be the 
difference. He must have seen something that I can't see. <laughs> Maybe he wanted to gain space, but yeah. Honestly, I'm not able to see the big point of G4, but it's never in vain. So, okay, a useful move. Bishop E6, and now we should just continue to run. Yeah, Smyslov says that uh, Black is lost here. If he plays passively, he must play something active. And that's what Botvinnik played. He played knight takes b6. I know we, we don't want to play this, but what else should we play here? I mean, the pawn will just run and uh, yeah, sooner or later, white will bring other pieces to to the queen side and uh, it should be very difficult for, for black. Maybe, just maybe, one idea of g4 was also that he would like to play h4 and, and move over the rook. I don't know. So you don't have to castle anymore in this game, obviously. Maybe, I'm just saying maybe. Let's see what happened here in the game. Knight takes b6, c takes b6, rook fb8. So that's Botvinnik's clever idea. He wants to play here rook takes b6, eliminating at least one of those best pawns, taking into account that the rook on the one is undefended. And here, Smyslov made a little mistake. I just wanted to, to know, in order to finish today's lesson, uh, I wanted to know if somebody can see the best move for white here. It's not what he played in the game. So, two minutes, send me what, what you think is White's best choice here. Okay, time's up. This was a complex one. Many people suggest to play C4 here. Interesting. I'm, I'm not just sure what happens if I play C5, so that the pawn doesn't reach C5. Others were saying Rook A4, tactical idea. However, it's important to notice that Black can actually take here, and we're just in time to play rook a1 and rook b1. Although, if we look carefully at this, we can see that if white plays something like, let's say, rook king d2, if rook b1, white can actually save this pawn, right? We can play here bishop a6. And I don't know what, what we have. Is, is white winning? Maybe he, maybe he is. I mean, it's a question of time, because if black's king is able to reach c7, it takes, takes many moves, but... Uh, I'm not able to give a complete uh, verdict here. Also, there is this idea. So, oh, king c2 and, oh, king c2 and rook b1. I'm lost then, am I? No way I can save myself here, right? Good point, good point. That's uh, what the solution is about. So, did I mess it up here somehow? No, maybe white is winning here as well. Uh-huh. Okay, so if you said uh, bishop b3 at the end, says Zoe, when, when is that? Here, oh, oh, nice, nice, nice discovery. We just have to prevent White's plan. King c1 then, but then the rook doesn't get to b1. And perhaps run with the king now. Run, 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 try to reach the pawn. Who knows? Interesting variation. Uh, in the game, just for the record, Smyslov played here bishop d3. And it's basically the same idea. And the game went like this. Yeah, black is not in time to take on h1, u2, b7. But what Vinik played instead, rook a2, king a3, and well, later on, uh, white won the game. But there was a nicer path to victory, and Nathaniel found this one. So please, Nathan, share with us how to win with white here. Let's see if you can see the whole variation. Well, I went king f2 so that after rook takes b6, a takes b6, rook takes a1, th there's no check. So, sure. then, so then white can go... White can go. <laughs> it's very similar to the other variation that we looked at. Oh, Zoe says bishop e5. Is that possible? Nice. But I can play rook a2 and rook b2, right? What Smyslov claims here is that white should play first b7, and after rook b1, we should play bishop a6. Now, how is this different from the other variation? We had this position. Weird and weird. So, so the people who were saying rook a4, you were right as well. Yeah, it's it's about the same same position, right? Anyway, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter. Let's see how how Smyslov's variation ends here. So Smyslov is saying that here. Oh, I know what's the difference. Okay, I know, guys. What's the big difference? I think I know. Now, if Rook B6, since the King is on F2, we're ready to go Rook B1, right? Black doesn't make it to go to E8, so we will just be winning. Bishop D5, we can just play C4. Right? What do, you what do you say, Nathan? It seems like white is winning here, right? 
-hmm. Maybe because he, he can play like this. Yeah, no idea really. This this is not convincing. Yeah, we, we should probably take on, on C4 and it should be a technical win here. Interesting. Anyway, let's see the fancy variation that Smyslov gave in his book. Rook B2 check, King E3, King F8. Okay, it's your move now, Nathan, how to win here. Just stick to the plan. Help the pawn. The rook should help the pawn before the king gets there. So, what would you play? Well, I would play rook a1. Okay, rook a1 also interesting, but it seems like if your bishop would be obstructing the rook, right? Then so bishop e5. Aha, but then you would win the exchange, but perhaps you wouldn't win the game, or am I mistaken? If you play something like this, I might be able to, to play for a fortress here. If you play something like this, I already have uh, one pawn. Okay, but you have rook h8 coming up here. Yeah, maybe you're right. 